Today's show is sponsored by Yaffa Bay and her Spirit of Tepereth Metaphysical Marketplace, here to provide you and your naturally special gifts with guidance and support through your life's journey. Providing you tools such as candles, incense, charms, jewelry, oils, crystals, and much more. Visit them at 1273 West Broad Street in Columbus, Ohio, or online at spiritoftepereth.com. You can find all our sponsors' information in the show notes on our website. Now let's start the show. Welcome to the Articles of ADOS podcast, a weekly show where we bring you undiscussed news, articles, and information important to the American descendants of slavery, our friends and our allies. I am your host, Lisa Todd, along with my co-host, Daoud Giazan. Guess what today is? Guess what we've got in store? Um, uh, let's see, maybe, uh... It's an archive dive. The archive dive is where we take a full show and select articles from the past and see Let me if- go back up and say, <coughs> oh, okay. <laughs> let, me, let me say that. <laughs> it was just weird how it transitioned. Mm-hmm. It's an archive dive. Oh, oh, okay. The archive dive is where we take a full show and select articles from the past and see if they still hold true. We choose a year, any year, before the current one and look back at the state of ADOS through the articles of that time. The year we chose to dive into today is 1965. Coming up later in the show, we will go back and share articles from The Guardian Observer, Encyclopedia Britannica, The Washington Examiner. Stay tuned. Are we forgetting something? What's that? The personality piece. Oh, yeah, let's not forget to show our personalities. Personality. Peace. 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 I'll start by posing a question. Why this year? Why 1965? Are there any memories or stories? What's going on? What, why did I choose 1965? Well, it was the year that my mother graduated from high school. I was just interested to see, you know, what was going on in her world when she um, was just going out into the world really striking out on her own, leaving her hometown, a very small hometown, um, into the big city of Little Rock, Arkansas. So I just wanted to see, um, you know, what was going on um, at that time. I don't really have any memories. I wasn't alive. My mom uh, probably would have some memories. Um, But um, that's the reason why I chose that year. I wanted to be nosy. (laughs) <laughs> well, I was two years of age, transitioning to three years, and I was doing a lot of uh, precocious type things. I really enjoyed life, and uh, um, I remember living with my great-grandmother, um, and she was phenomenal for me in my early years, and we were all cooped up in a very small house, and my parents had been able to get an extension, and because of my birth, they were concerned uh, that they used to have a swimming pool, and they they covered up the swimming pool just to make sure I wouldn't fall in, even though that would happen when we would go to uh, uh, what a place we called the Olympics, and I accidentally fell in, and I was able to swim without any assistance, so that's what I was doing around age three. And you were here in, in, in Columbus? I was in Springfield, Ohio. Springfield, Ohio. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Are you busy? Is the news coming so fast you can barely keep up? No worries. The Articles of Ados podcast is here to help. Hit the subscribe button wherever you're listening right now, and we'll make sure you stay up to date on the news and information that affects you and your ADOS life. In researching this year, 1965 was during a turbulent time, so I'm looking forward to seeing how our ADOS community was affected. In today's interesting facts segment, what was life like in 1965? First facts is that the president of the United States was Lyndon B. Johnson and his vice president was Hubert H. Humphrey. Price of a new car, $2,650. Price of gas per gallon, 31 cents. Price of a first class stamp, 5 cents. Price of a loaf of bread was 21 cents. 
price of eggs, 53 cents, and the price of a gallon of milk was 95 cents. And those were the interesting facts of 1965. Oh, happy day. In this segment, we reach back and see what were the top headlines of 1965. 1965 Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act guaranteeing African Americans the right to vote becomes law on August 6th. The Voting Rights Act is signed into law which prohibited most of the unfair practices used to prevent blacks from registering to vote and provided for federal registrars to go to Alabama and other states with a history of voting related discrimination to ensure that the law was implemented. Headline news number two. Northeast blackout, including parts of Canada and the United States Northeast, several U.S. states, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New York, and portions of New Jersey and parts of Canada are hit by a series of blackouts lasting up to 13 and a half hours. 30 million people were affected. Headline news number three, the first U.S. combat troops arrive in Vietnam. By the end of the year, 190,000 American soldiers are in Vietnam. Throughout the year, the war in Vietnam continued to worsen as whatever the Americans do, including major bombing of North Vietnam, they continue to lose more men. At the same time, the anti-war movement grew and on November 13, 35,000 marched on Washington as a protest against the war. Headline news number four. Palm Sunday tornado outbreak. The Palm Sunday tornado outbreak on April 13th, the Midwest region of the United States experienced a large tornado outbreak on Palm Sunday in 1965. In April, tornadoes hit six states, including Iowa, Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, Indiana, and Ohio. There were a total of 47 tornadoes that were reported and confirmed, and the storms caused hundreds of millions of dollars worth of damage to the region. Over 1,000 people were injured, and there were 271 reported fatalities from the tornado outbreak. (laughs) Top of the charts, top of the box office. Throughout the show, we will stop and see what people were watching and listening to in 1965. First list is... The top films. Number one was The Sound of Music. Number two, Ship of Fools. Number three, The Pawn Broker. Number four, Darling 74. Number five was The Collector. Number six, Those Magnificent Men in Their Flying Machines. Number seven, Dr. Jivago. Number eight, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold. Number nine, The Ipcris File. And finally, number 10, The Great Race. What we're gonna do right here is go back, way back, 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 back into time. time. We're gonna go back and grab four articles from 1965, Will the information still be relevant to the ADOS community? Has things changed or stayed the same? Each one of us will present two articles and discuss it, elaborate, or ask a question or two. So let's get ready to archive dive. Archive dive number one. Publication, The Guardian Observer, entitled Selma to Montgomery, Martin Luther King and the March for Freedom. Tagline, on the 21st of March, 1965, after a months long battle, the Freedom March finally set off from Selma to Montgomery to lobby for voter registration. Here's how the Guardian and Observer covered the struggle. The 1964 Civil Rights Act outlawed discrimination based on race in the United States, but while legally black people were allowed to vote, some Southern state officials obstructed their efforts to register. Local groups in Selma had already been agitating for change, but when Dr. Martin Luther King chose it as the testing ground for his black voter registration campaign in early 1965, it drew national attention to the Alabama town. The pivotal moment came on Sunday, 7 March, as demonstrators began a march from Selma to the state capitol. As the marchers crossed Edmund Pettus Bridge in their route out of Selma, they were met by a posse of state troopers armed with nightsticks and wearing gas masks. A warning was given to disband. Reverend Hosea Williams, leading the march, tried to speak but was told there was nothing to discuss. Then the troopers moved in. The marchers were chased, beaten, tear-gassed, was thrown, and officers on horseback charged the crowd. 
In the aftermath of Bloody Sunday, King himself led a symbolic march across the bridge once again. While demonstrators were more determined than ever to proceed, federal protection was needed if they were to make it to Montgomery safely. Stopped by police, the marchers kneeled and prayed, then turned around and retreated back into Selma. When the Freedom March finally set off on 21 March, thousands had joined the ranks, spurred on by the murder of white minister James Reeb, a civil rights activist who had come to Selma after Bloody Sunday. Martin Luther King led alongside religious leaders from all faiths and denominations. Priests and reverends, nuns and rabbis, black and white, marched together. By the time they reached the Capitol four days later, the numbers had swelled to over 30,000. The Guardian's editorial on the 26th of March, 1965, declared that, while there was much still to be done, the message from the march to Montgomery reads full of hope. Commentary. Commentary. What do we think? It was definitely a phenomenal achievement and horrible event simultaneously that made a difference in the hearts of minds of people around the world. It was significant in, in bolstering support and motivating change in the society. Um, but as time has gone on, uh, we are back to other types of forms of voter suppression, specifically on the poor, more specifically on black Americans. And uh, that is the continued problem. Um, there is uh, a reference to uh, the website, as well as an image that was drawn at the time, uh, which depicted a black man crawling towards a tombstone reading equal and him trying to reach it. We're still living the realities of that little illustration, sad to say. Other than the photographs and the news reports of that time, they're horrible in themselves, seeing the images. And I think that's what affected most Americans at the time is seeing for the first time they're seeing live the horrors that black people at that time that were going through just trying to exercise their rights. They're still hard to see to this day, in my opinion, you know, especially the dog attacks and, and, and the batons, you know, up against people's heads. And that's man, woman, child, you know, at the time. So I think Martin Luther King strategy, although controversial, you know, amongst, you know, the more radical, um, I think it's still the deal for uh, Johnson at the time to move forward with a lot of his um, plans for voting um, for the Voting Rights Act. Yes, it was hard to look at, but it created so much change. And I agree, definitely the change is taking place Yet at the same time, over time, uh, what I prefer to call white domination racism, it merely adapts. And that's what's happened. It's adapted by way of ensuring more conservative justices on the Supreme Court. It's uh, mutated further by uh, changing the focus of what is interrupted, namely uh, people being able to at one time thinking it was a positive thing to be able to register while, uh, you know, updating your uh your auto license at the same time, what they've done is either close them or make restrictions, making it harder to obtain them through that method. So it continues to mutate. Um, what the problem also is, is that especially with regards to voter suppression, uh, people are coached or conditioned to believe that it's mainly coming from the issues of people who are conservative and Republican. What is often missing from the table, and uh, the investigative reporter Greg Pallast uh, has done phenomenal work, and I'm going to be including a lot of his work as we approach the 2020 elections, uh, because he's really right on point. Another way it mutated was that uh, the electronic technology has been able to improve things and gave people access to voting by way of electronic voting. Uh, the reality is, since the 2000 election, uh, they've been effective in continuing undermining uh, electronic voting, and they continue to have, 20 years later, persistent problems with electronic voting. It's another method of black voter suppression. Uh, but it's not just shared in on, uh, shared by or approached by uh, conservative. It's also uh, highly accessed by way of the Democratic Party, who is, as we know in the 2016 election, attempted to appeal to white voters. Um, in doing so, they have to reduce 
on the local level and primary levels, uh, voters who are more likely to be left of center. And that is disproportionately and overwhelmingly black voters. So in, a, in essence, Greg Pallast reports that uh, while the Republicans uh, suppress votes that impact national elections, the Democrats suppro- uh, suppress votes of black people disproportionately on local or and primary levels so that it'll affect a change that will be more appealing to conservative whites. And we have not uh, effectively adjusted to that form of, mut- of white domination, racist mutation, as it affects our abilities to vote and have our voices heard. Up next, I have archive dive number two, titled Watts Riot of 1965, published in the Encyclopedia Britannica, written by Jill A. Eddy. Watts Riots of 1965, series of violent confrontations between Los Angeles police and residents of Watts and other predominantly African-American neighborhoods south no, <clears throat> and residents of Watts and other predominantly African-American neighborhoods of South Central Los Angeles that began August 11, 1965 and lasted for six days. The immediate cause of the disturbance was the arrest of an African-American man, Marquette Fry, by a white California highway patrol officer on suspicion of driving while intoxicated. Although most accounts now agree that Fry resisted arrest, it remains unclear whether excessive force was used to subdue him. The riots resulted in the deaths of 34 people, while more than 1,000 were injured and more than and more than 40 million worth of property was destroyed. Many of the most vivid images of the riots depict the massive fire set by the rioters. Hundreds of buildings and whole city blocks were burned to the ground. Firefighters were unable to work because police could not protect them from the rioters. Public officials in the news media offered conflicting interpretation of the Watts riots in their immediate aftermath. Some conservatives and many city officials claimed that the violence had resulted from wanton lawlessness, and they pointed to the large number of minority men living in the inner city who had criminal records and to the influx of outsiders from the South. Many federal officials and some reporters explained the riots as a protest against the poverty and hopelessness of life in the inner city, and they described the challenges of joblessness and the lack of basic services in South Central Los Angeles. The interpretation of the riots dovetailed effectively with President Lyndon B. Johnson's War on Property programs, which were then being introduced in cities across the country. Commentary. Commentary. Who do we think? Based on the research of this year, this riot was the one that kind of spearheaded a lot of President Johnson's um, War on Poverty. Mm-hmm. And got the ball rolling on a lot of programs that were designed to, one, not have this happen again, which was loss of property, mainly, which they were concerned about. And then maybe superficial, knowing his um, history, just trying to show that, uh, okay, we're gonna do something about the inner city. In my next article, you'll see that, what were um, some of their concerns, but, as a black community, we always get a negative connotation when this type of thing occurs. And that's where we're seen as burning our own neighborhoods down. We're seen as being unlawful. But I never noticed riots in the suburbs. So what is happening in the inner cities that is creating an atmosphere where people want to rise up and burn? Number one, not anything that they're most likely owning, but their neighborhoods that they're living in, which is which already has blight, unemployment, high crime, environmental hazards everywhere. Everybody is is, is close in proximity and packed together as, as rats are. Is that not understandable that that what they call is a power keg ready, ready to burst? Mixed with racism, this is a perfect storm. A lot of our inner cities then were perfect storms and are becoming more perfect storms now. These neighborhoods, these communities are getting the short end of the stick on on one hand. On one hand, they are, you know, blamed for burning their own communities. On the other hand, what kind of community is it? So that's my commentary on the Watts riot. Um, I 
I don't know anybody personally that was, um, I didn't have family there at the time. Um, my, most of my family was in the South. So I, I don't have any firsthand, you know, stories of, okay, you know, this was what life was like and this is what happened and, and what it is. All I've seen is um, the photographs and, and the um, news reports. I'm going to take a long view on this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, results. I'm going to do this in two ways. Uh, one is the long view uh, of most cultural anthropologists that are worth uh, their weight in gold or salt. And uh, the reason why you don't see them interviewed from political shows to social sh shows or invited to speak on these things uh, that could offer some light as to what's going on is because of what I'm about to say. The culture anthropologist will let you know that class-based societies, especially hierarchical societies with an indifferent and aggressively indifferent hierarchy will often result in explosions. And uh, you just, just sort of said that. Um, it's not a surprise, it's not an accident, it's not some wizardry that comes in. What happens all too often though is that the poor get blamed. And this is the poor in 1830s or 1840s Britain, you know, less than 1% of blacks there. Um, they were having the same problems. Um, and they got so upset that the hierarchy in their societies decided to, hey, let them have uh, some form of universal health care. Do you see where I'm going? Mm -hmm. um, effectively in the United States though, from Shays Rebellion, adequately called, all the way to the Watts Rebellion, not riot, rebellion. Uh, this is the same dynamic. Uh, you have an indifferent and, and or aggressively indifferent hierarchy that doesn't give a darn about this struggling average person. And so there's a particular dynamic that takes shape. Here I go to the other side. Every commission that has been addressing this, whether it be the Kerner Commission in 1968 uh, to the one that followed the rebellion of 1992 in Los Angeles, comes to the same conclusion. A history of oppression in various forms, whether it be exploiting the population uh, through legal means or extra legal means, or businesses allowed to extract uh, resources from a region, and also uh, they are initiated, this long-term ongoing oppression culminates into inappropriate actions by police officers, people in authority that take advantage or harm members of the community where the community lashes out in response. So this is like nothing new. These are the conclusions of, of modern commissions that go to study this, all the way to cultural anthropologists that have identified this as a consistent pattern in hierarchy-based societies, especially if they're highly Europeanized. Uh, and so this should not be a surprise. What, what often happens is that scapegoat, scapegoating and just lazy excuses are used to explain away why it's happening and often citing the actions of the, those who've been living through oppression as the cause of the problem. Well, that's de deflectionary, that's uh, obfuscating responsibility of people who have power in the society. And again, this is happening, this was happening in, in, in the 1800s in, in Britain, and it, it's happened through, uh, through cycles of the same dynamic in American society ever since. If you or a family member have firsthand knowledge of the Watts riot of 1965, please tag us on Twitter, let us know what, what it was, or go to our Facebook group where we would love to hear your stories. <laughs> top of the TV charts, top of the TV charts. What were the most popular TV shows in 1965? Number one, Bonanza. Number two, Gomer Powell, USMC. Number three, The Lucy Show. Number four, The Red Skelton Show. Number five, Batman, Thursdays. <laughs> Number six, The Andy Griffith Show. Number seven, Bewitched. Number eight, The Beverly Hillbillies. Number nine, Hogan's Heroes. And 10, Batman. And up next we have... Archive Dive number three from the publication, The Guardian Observer, entitled Malcolm X Killed, 50th Anniversary from the Archive. Tagline, it's 50 years since black leader Malcolm X was gunned down at a rally in Harlem. 
Here's how the story played out in the pages of The Guardian and Observer. Malcolm X, the militant black Muslim leader, was in some ways the polar opposite of Dr. Martin Luther King. Where King called for civil rights through peaceful protest, Malcolm X often advocated violence as the only means of forcing change on a reluctant American society. On a visit to the UK in December 1964, he told an audience at Manchester University that civil rights would be attained by the ballot or the bullet. Malcolm X had been one of the key leaders of the Nation of Islam movement led by Elijah Muhammad. But after splitting from Muhammad in 1964, he established his own group, the Organization for Afro-American Unity, OAAU. Louis Nicosi, writing in The Observer, said the division would have a far-reaching and possibly explosive impact on the civil rights movement in the United States. The split with the Nation of Islam was acrimonious. On the 14th of February, 1965, Malcolm X, his wife and daughter, escaped a firebomb attack on their New York house. The nation claimed ownership of the property and had been attempting to evict him. Hella Pick wrote in The Guardian that Malcolm X has no shortage of enemies. A week later, on the 21st of February, Malcolm X was attending an OAAU rally at a ballroom in Harlem, New York. As he stepped onto the podium to address the crowd, shots rang out and he fell to the ground, fatally wounded. Three members of the Nation of Islam were convicted of his murder in March 1966. In a speech at the London School of Economics published by The Guardian after his death, Malcolm X compared the involvement of white liberals in the civil rights struggle to coffee which is strong and hot until you add cream and then it gets cooler and cooler until you don't have any coffee. He also defined his notion of violent protest. Quoting, We are not for violence in any shape or form, but believe that the people who have violence committed against them should be able to defend themselves. By what they are doing to me, they arouse me to violence. People should only be nonviolent as long as they are dealing with a nonviolent person. Intelligence demands the return of violence with violence. Author, writer, The Guardian staff. Commentary. Commentary. What do we think? Yeah, that was the year that uh, our brother Malcolm had, uh, was assassinated. Since then, there's been so many different versions, so many different who did and what, who didn't who was responsible, who stoked the flame for this. Was it the CIA? Was it the FBI? Was it, what is that man's name? What's the Cointel guy's name? Uh, J. Edgar Hoover? Yes. Was it Hoover? <laughs> <laughs> was it Hoover and his boys? Um, who, who, who killed Malcolm X? And of course, um, there are so many different versions. Um, there's been documentaries, there's been movies, there's been articles and books and all lead to the fact that uh, a great warrior, a great black voice was silenced. Um, wow. Uh, if, if we see what happened to Malcolm in isolation, then we're left with conclusions that were ultimately drawn for us, uh, ultimately. Uh, rather than the context of what was happening. And I think people know this at some level. As a child, I remember in the 60s and into the 70s, I would go to visit relatives' homes and they would have five pictures up, one of white Jesus, and then they'd have four other pictures of JFK, RFK, Malcolm X, and Martin Luther King. And I think at some level, we know that there was a coordinated effort to ensure a particular outcome in this society that would take away from values that would have made a more humane and just society. I think people know that in their gut. How to go about that, though, has been very difficult because as I shared in the commentation earlier, class-based hierarchical societies often explode. And because of this, we've had assassinations take place during a critical time in the 60s where we're at the high point of wealth and people were complaining um, 
And this was also average white people who were complaining about the direction the society was going. Well, we now know through fantastic work of investigative reporter, reporters and journalists that JFK was in talks with people that we were told we were enemies of. He was trying to make a better world and society. He's assassinated at the hands of a lone gunman who's crazed and bewildered uh, and all that stuff. Although deeper investigations show he himself was an agent and he most likely believed he was to interrupt such an attempt. But that's for another story. Then we have what happened to Malcolm X. I understand there's a very popular documentary out now on Netflix and people are just hungry to hear, uh, and I haven't seen it, but they're very eager to hear what I found out in the 80s. And I wasn't the only journalist. There were other people that were talking about this person that was most likely involved in his assassination at the time. So this is really, for me, nothing new. And again, I haven't seen the, do the documentary. Only thing I will say about that is, is that on the same day that Malcolm X is killed, a gentleman by the name of Pinto in Africa was also killed. Why is that significant? Because Malcolm X was spending time with Pinto as they were attempting to craft uh, documents that would bring the concerns of the American Negro to the uh, International Supreme Court, uh, International Court and uh, United Nations. It's interesting that those two die on the same day. These people often send a message and that the goal of doing what earlier giants uh, like Paul Robeson had tried to do uh, to bring our concerns to on a national stage were interestingly interrupted on the same day. So I believe that any deflection from that is in fact a deflection. Um, you go on to uh, Martin Luther King's assassination. 1999 in court showed that he was killed by five or six elements. The mafia who did not like his peace stance because it would have interrupted on the gun trade. Gun trade is still very active around the world and all these skirmishes we're hearing about international news. American companies who build these things from, from guns to slave uh, uh, confinement devices is running rampant in the world right now. Well, King was in front of that and the mafia was heavily involved in that and they saw his peace efforts and to get people to vie for peace uh, 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 instead of war because it's uh, um, uh, to transfer funds for the emerging war on poverty programs that Lyndon Bain Johnson was going, he foresaw would go to nothing. And it did by the mid seventies. It went to nothing because of war efforts. Um, then you had the uh, CIA and a known military hit squad that were also present at, at his shooting. Uh, in fact, a local police officer is the one who did the shot, who was also involved with the mafia. All this is documented. All this is uh, been shared during the trial regarding the wrongful death of Martin Luther King that his family bought uh, in 1999. Um, it's even on film. And one of the people, the person who did the filming of his shooting testified to that on, 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 in, during the, the hearing. Uh, so the larger reality, reality is the shot did not kill Martin Luther King. We now know because of this hearing and judgment found in favor of the King family, that he was smothered to death by the very person that was supposed to be taking care of him in his bed. And I knew this in 1999, and I know other people knew this in 1999. Janet Reno was supposed to take this on for further investigation, but she chose not to. And here we are in a state of another fallen justice warrior taken down. And then we have Robert Kennedy. And, you know, it's so crazy that the American public fell for what happened, but I understand. Uh, he, uh, Sirhan Surin was in front of him, but the shot that killed him were shots that came from behind and, and less than two inches from his, his rear, uh, right ear. Come on. At some level, we know an injustice has done, been done. One of the reasons why I, I haven't voted for any Democrats since the late, uh, eighties, early nineties is because no one was championing this horrible course 
of de facto coup d'etat in the form of killing justice, people who are seeking justice for all people in America. They've chosen another course. I supported Cynthia McKinney and her uh, support uh, through the Green Party for president because this was one of her agenda items to reopen these cases and do the investigations necessary to hold the criminals that are still around at that time, still living, some of them, to hold them accountable for what's happened. And I sincerely believe in addition to reparations, this is something that also needs to be discussed. But right now I'm still focused on reparations, but we do need to really hold these people accountable because we're on the course we're on now is as a result, I sincerely believe of those four, and there's been more, but those four primary assassinations that took place and they're all highly questionable. And the one that was proven to be involved from the state uh, is the uh, the assassination of Martin Luther King. Well, I, I did see the Netflix documentary, um, a Muslim brother um, did the documentary um, who he had for, I believe, uh, been investigating Malcolm's um, assassination for about 20 years. And I don't want to spoil the outcome of the documentary. I don't want to spoil that for anyone, but it was shocking. It was it was shocking and not shocking who he concluded killed Malcolm. I'm gonna just leave it there and let let the audit let the listeners go ahead uh, and and check that documentary out. Um, it's it makes you angry all over again, and so and I'll I'll just leave it there. It makes you it makes you it can make you angry all over again, I'm but it doesn't bring him back. I would like to say one thing about that. Um, I heard as a result of the documentary that a uh, AG somewhere is going to reopen the case. Yeah, that's the great outcome of it. But I, I'm going to say okay. that the investigation they're going to open, I'm telling you now, it's going to go nowhere. It's going to go nowhere. No one's going to be held accountable because the, the people that are actually involved, the people that really pull the strings, pay the money, everything for all four of the uh, assassinations. They're all connected to the same people that are robbing the country right now. Mm. And they're not going to be held accountable any way, shape or form. The person that was the judge that was involved in hearing James Ill Ray's case originally when he tried to change his verdict, died of a heart attack. Mm. So you could call it conspiracy theory all you want, because all that term has been used for is to get people not to think and put dots together that make sense at least. But for people that should be involved in investigations like Janet Rita, when she got the, the results of this hearing from a jury of, of half of white, half of black people that determined the government was involved in Martin Luther King's case and not to pursue that is a further indication of how corrupt our system has become and bringing justice to everyone, but particularly to ADOS. <laughs> All right, archive dive number four. This report is from the publication of from the Office of Policy Planning and Research from the United States Department of Labor. Titled The Negro Family, the Case for National Action, known as the Moynihan Report, dated 1965, was written by Daniel Patrick Moynihan, an American sociologist serving as Assistant Secretary of Labor under President Lyndon B. Johnson of the United States. In 1976, Moynihan was elected to the first of several terms as U.S. Senator from New York and continued to support liberal programs to try to end poverty. His report focused on the deep roots of black poverty in the United States and controversially concluded that the high rate of families headed by single mothers would greatly hinder progress of blacks toward economic and political equality. Moynihan argued that the rise in black single mother families was caused not by lack of jobs, but by a destructive vein in ghetto culture, which could be traced to slavery times and continued discrimination in the American South under Jim Crow. Black sociologist E. Franklin Frazier had introduced that idea in the 1930s, but Moynihan was considered one of the first academics to defy conventional social science wisdom about the structure of poverty. As he wrote later, the work began in the most orthodox setting, the U.S. Department of Labor to establish at some level of statistical consciousness that what everyone knew, that economic conditions determined social conditions. 
whereupon it turned out that what everyone knew was evidently not so. When Moynihan published his report in 1965, the out of wedlock birth rate among blacks was 25%, much higher than whites. In the introduction to his report, Moynihan said that the gap between the Negro and most other groups in American society is widening. He also said that the collapse of the nuclear family in the black lower class would preserve the gap between possibilities for Negroes and other groups and favor other ethnic groups. He acknowledged the continued existence of racism and discrimination within society despite the victories that blacks had won by civil rights legislation. Moynihan concluded the steady expansion of welfare programs can be taken as a measure of the steady disintegration of the Negro family structure over the past generation in the United States. In conclusion, from the time of its publication, the report has been sharply attacked by black and civil rights leaders as examples of white patronizing cultural bias or racism. At various times, the, re the report has been condemned or dismissed by the NAACP and other civil rights groups and leaders such as Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton. Critics accuse Moynihan of relying on stereotypes of the black family and black men implying that blacks had inferior academic performance, portrayed crime and pathology as endemic to the black community and failing to recognize the cultural bias and racism in standardized tests had contributed to apparent lower achievement by blacks in schools. The report was criticized for threatening to undermine the place of civil rights on the national agenda, leaving a vacuum that could be filled with politics that blame blacks for their own troubles. Psychologist William Ryan coined the phrase blaming the victim in his 1971 book, Blaming the Victim, specifically as a critique of Moynihan's report. He said that it was an attempt to divert responsibility for poverty from social structure factors to the behaviors and cultural patterns of the poor. Commentary. Commentary. What do we think? The Moynihan report seems to be touted and used by the conservatives and praised by other black conservatives as the Bible basically of what's wrong with the black community. And the scapegoat of this report is the single black female led families. Once again, we are being blamed for the failures of the black community and the conservatives have a report to point to as the truth. Uh, I am in agreement with many of the critics that this is victim blaming. Uh, there are many factors in why poverty is high in the black community. Um, one of which has nothing to do with a black led female family. Are there is black children being raised in two parent family homes? The ideal? Yes. Um, so I don't get too long winded. I'm going to go use another long view to address this um, and hitting three areas. The first area that I'm going to hit is he was criticized at the time, but the reality is we live in a white domination racist society. So they uh, what elements he did indicate other factors that were involved in these outcomes, these negative outcomes economically for African-Americans. Um, it was cherry picked by both conservatives and other conservative Democrats. We call them the blue dog Democrats and those in the North who imitated them are Joe Biden. Uh, they took elements and cherry picked those things to justify scapegoating of the people instead of dealing with the critical issues that impacted human lives. So that's number one and that's focused on the report. But largely people also omit and sadly too many among us also also omit that welfare as it's criticized government handouts all the other negative connotations it's rather interesting to me given that we were largely excluded from benefiting from such government uh, largesse um, and it was purposely done we were not allowed to benefit from them well who was benefiting from them while we spent roughly 35 to 40 years in large numbers not gaining access to them because we were you know all too often sharecroppers and housemaids and those were particular areas that were excluded to benefit from that. White people or people that would later be identified as white people uh, benefited from such programs. 
helping millions becoming a part of the middle class by the 60s and 70s. So when did uh, African-Americans largely begin to benefit from this is when they left the South and went into the city areas and uh, established some of them jobs and some of them not getting jobs and were therefore struggling. And therefore their desire to gain access to the American dream needed the assistance of welfare, just as it had benefited whites. The reality is when blacks in larger numbers began to benefit from the practice, the common practice of the government realizing that that economies are not perfect and therefore people do need help, they began to put tighter restrictions on blacks access, resulting in the exclusion of the thing that they claim to value, the nuclear family, therefore undermining uh, black men and women's ability to glean further uh, that government largesse if they decided to remain together. And that begins the course. Now, this is not happening in isolation. South Africa and the erection of apartheid did the same thing, separated purposely because their goal was to limit births. As I talked about in our uh, regular headline programming, uh, that there was a purposeful attempt by the 1940 results of uh, the study, the largest such study uh, that has been done on race in America, an American dilemma, the Negro problem in, in America and modern democracy, determined that they would use a final solution approach that was slow in motion and that would impact fertility. What better way to impact, impact fertility but to reduce the likelihood of black men and women being able to cohabitate? Further on, you then criticize for what children are created out of such interactions. Um, and that becomes a problem. And we're just looking at Charles Dickens all over again, because that was the same hierarchical stance the elite there had against the lower classes there and blacks were not in large numbers there. Same dynamic. Again, it's what cultural anthropologists would say if they'd ever got a center stage anywhere. Uh, the last area I want to talk about, and this is to be the most obvious in terms of hypocrisy, like uh, welfare benefiting whites largely, helping millions of them achieve middle class status in the society, but is somehow a hindrance when black people are benefiting from it in large numbers. This stuff is so easy, I can't believe that we are even still having these discussions. The last area, though, is the ghetto, mm -hmm. which we affectionately call the hood. Um, it's really, really sick when one realizes the origin of the ghetto uh, emerging in European societies, again, Europeanized hierarchical societies are all too often explosive and destructive. And so what they did for their historically despised group, they erected ghettos, places that would undermine family function, that would undermine and create dysfunctional families living in tight quarters with minimal resources. That has an impact. And their goal was to disillusion their historical uh, despised groups in Europe, uh, particularly aimed at European Jews, lower caste European Jews, to ultimately slow motion exterminate them. Well, you know, if they have ghettos here that we're redlined into and situated into, uh, what is the result? The result is going to be some level of dysfunction. Who's ever there? And therefore, it should not be a surprise. Limited resources purposefully, tight and small uh, living locations purposely produce stressors on family functioning that undermines its longevity and creates crime, which is one of the things that are therefore pointed at that group for having a disproportionate in involvement in when it should be of no surprise. So, so Monihan can talk about the surface element of that institutional created function of the society, which is to take care of, undermine, disassociate and cause dysfunction in historically despised groups. Same thing in Europe with no blacks president. They were doing it to the Eastern Europeans and all America did was do the same thing here. First with the native population on reservations, which is just another form of a ghetto. And they've done so with, uh, the historically despised groups here in America, from the Italians, which weren't seen as white when they first came here, Irish that weren't seen as first as whites when they first came here, they were ghettoized and they eventually emerged into white status. Blacks cannot and have not, uh, except those few that are able to escape in terms of earning potential, 
have been able to uh, get out of the ghetto. The issue is not getting out of the ghetto. The issue is changing the psychology and institutional forces that created ghettos in the first place because they were meant to cause the problems that we observe, period. Well, <laughs> sorry. no, no, uh, this report, and, I, and I'm gonna close it out on this, this report has five chapters and I encourage the ADOS family to read the report. Ladies, yes, is going to blame us. We're the reason, you know, we all always get that. Um, we're the reason why uh, our community is in the, uh, the state that it was in then and now. But as my co-host so eloquently put, put it, it was designed this way, so why are you blaming us? If you designed it, why are you blaming us? So um, let me know what you think of the report. I've heard of this report in passing, morning your hand, morning your hand. I've heard it, I've mm -hmm. heard it, but uh, I've never read it. So um, uh, give yourself a, a, a good hour or so to go into it and, and see if in your opinion it still holds true. That's it for today's Archive Dive. As always, the articles featured will be listed in our show notes and shared in our Facebook group. We want to take the time to give our friends and listeners a shout out. Thank you for clicking that subscribe button and for liking and sharing the podcast. You can also continue supporting the show by joining our Patreon, where you can receive exclusive content and promotional items for as little as $3 a month. Sponsoring the show will ensure that we can continue to bring you the news and information important to your ADOS life. So head on over and join us at patreon.com slash articles of ADOS. And the last segment of the day, top of the music charts. What was the top R&B of 1965? Top R&B songs were number one, four tops. I can't help myself. Sugar Pie, Honey Bunch. Number two, The Temptations, My Girl. Number three, Fontella Bass, Rescue Me. Number four, James Brown, I Got You, I Feel Good. Number five, Joe Tex, Hold What You've Got. Number six, The Supremes, Stop in the Name of Love. Number seven, Stevie Wonder, Uptight, Everything's All Right. Number eight, The Supremes, Back in My Arms Again. Number nine, James Brown, Papa's Got a Brand New Bag, Part One. And finally, number 10, Junior Walker and the All-Stars, Shotgun. Whatever. Okay. <laughs> I hear music in my head all the time. There you have it, family. Another week, another show. Thanks for joining us on the Articles of ADOS podcast. Make sure to visit our website, articlesofados.com, where you can join our mailing list, see the show notes for today's episode, and to leave us a voice message to be featured on the show. Now that you're family, we'd love it if you'd like our Facebook page and join our private Articles of ADOS group. This is where you can connect with other listeners, give feedback, and share articles you would like us to discuss. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, send us an email to listeners at articlesofados.com. Be sure to tune in next Thursday for a new episode of Undiscussed News You May Have Missed. Until next time, family, stay safe, stay strong. Peace. <laughs>